in a good way, in a good way, you know, I know this is a tough conversation for a lot of people, but in a good way, America, like American Orthodoxy kind of has like a long way to go in some regards because it's very easy to fall into the dichotomy and the disconnect. Um, they're just, if you think of, you know, if you, if you can have an image of like a body being created and here's a skeleton and then, you know, here's maybe the muscles, but then like, you know, the, the nerves and the veins are kind of slowly crawling up. It's like all the connective tissue isn't quite there yet. Like the, mm. the basic framework is there, mm. but all the connective tissue hasn't quite developed yet. Um, and, you know, I, I don't even know if it's, a, if it's so much a thing for America, but rather Americans, what, what that looks like, you know? Um, and, and I think also too, it, it, it's helped me, um, man, you know, time is such a funny thing. Um, and really stepping back and seeing, you know, our, our time spans are so small in comparison to everything, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, just seeing, you know, being in Dechini and still in Itza and just these incredible monasteries that have, you know, for centuries and centuries, centuries, you know, just, um, it really puts some things into context. Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to Royal Path. I am your host, Andrew, and tonight I'm going to ask Cyprian and Father Turbo, where were you guys on 9-11, 2001, no, I, I the big I one? Remember I remember. Well, I remember. I remember distinctly. You want to start, Father? I didn't have a TV. I, I got a TV because of 9-11. Uh, I woke up and I was in bed with my wife and I got a call and um, it was my sister. Uh, no, no, no. My sister? I can't remember my sister and my brother-in-law. But they were like, quick, quick, um, we're under attack, uh, turn on the TV. And I was like, uh, I don't got a TV. <laughs> um, and so we got a TV that afternoon. Um, but yeah, I, I remember. I remember. And um, I remember just being in a state of shock, but not in a state of shock like maybe everyone else was in a state of shock. It was kind of like, what's really happening? You know? Um, mm. Not like a 9 11 truth or thing, but just like, I didn't have a TV. And I was like, yeah, is this like, a, is this really a thing? Um, and then that afternoon being like, actually getting the TV and be like, whoa, this is, this is wild, you know, so. I, I was, uh, I was in LA. I, I was uh, at my girlfriend's house, actually. I had stayed over the night because my the office that I was uh, working out of was pretty close to her house. So I so I would stay, sleep over a lot of times because I was living in downtown and it would save me a, a long drive. And she had gone off to work and I woke up and same thing, like most people, I got a call. I forget who the call was from. One of my friends and they were like, I mean, this is the typical story, right? So they were like, they were like turn on the TV, a plane just no, I, it was actually from my girlfriend. She had gone to work. She called me. That's who it was. And she was like, turn on the TV. A plane just hit the World Trade Center. I was like, what? What are you talking about? And I was like, well, uh, OK. So I went in. What channel? And she's like, every channel. <laughs> that says everybody's <laughs> everybody's got that story. What channel? Every channel. So I turned it on. And yeah, it was like so many people. 
I was on the phone with her. I'm like, what is this? We're talking like, what? what is this? This is crazy. Is it an accident? Like what? So we're talking on the phone and then here comes the second plane. Boom, hits it, you know, and the and so we saw the second plane hit and then it was like, OK, this has got it. This is on purpose. This has got to be terrorism. And then, yeah, watching through the whole thing, the towers falling and the whole nine um, eleven. Yeah, the whole nine eleven. And it was um, I think the formative thing for me, though, in that experience it's not so much that, but I remember where I was when when I realized that something that that something was afoot. And it was not long. It was like two or three days later, it seems like to me. But I remember being in my office and we had a little computer in there where we would bow, browse the internet. And um Yeah, it it there was this site that came up very soon that was called like huntthebowing.com or something like that. But even before that, I remember going on to the Department of Defense's website because I was looking at for pictures of the Pentagon, right, just to see it. And I remember going through the pictures now completely removed, by the way, like completely removed like a month later. But I remember going through the pictures and coming across the one before the wall of the Pentagon had fallen and they were putting out the fire and it just had a hole in it and it showed like a long distance thing and the hole. And I was like, where's the plane? I remember thinking that to myself, like, where's the plane? And this was this was three days in. And from that point on, I was like, OK, but that first night, you know, we went out to a vigil in Santa Monica. It was so traumatic, man. I remember that it was and nobody knew what was going on. I just remember the chaos and confusion and. Yeah, it's crazy. That was so crazy. Well, where were you? I'm a little bit younger than you guys. So I was in remedial math, <laughs> which is the math class that me and one other kid had to go to from the, okay, so you're not such a smart kid class <laughs> where you had to basically go and everyone else did algebra and I had to stick with the basics and even struggled with that. Um, and my teacher walked in, uh, you know, all two of us. And then she walked in. It was, it was like basically a special ed class or whatever. And she walked in and said, oh my gosh, the train, the, the World Trade Center has just been crashed into by airplanes. And I was like, whoa, I was like, I don't know what the World Trade Center is. <laughs> like, I have no idea what that is. And like, it's, and she's like, oh, these big buildings in New York. And I was like, wow, okay, cool. And then I was like, and then they gathered us all in the cafeteria and they brought in a, like a TV and we watched it on TV. And I was like, and by that time, everything had gone down. They had fallen, like, you know, um, everything was happening. And as people were talking about, you know, uh, oh, you know, tens of thousands of people are dead and stuff like that. And, you know, it was just like the greatest, this is bigger than Pearl Harbor. And then I remember like, um, I made a joke. I was like, Hey guys, look, I'm a superhero. I can jump over the twin towers. And then I would just like, and I was like, really thought that was pretty funny. And then on the ride home, my brother was like, yeah, it's an inside job. And I remember getting like viscerally angry at him. How dare you say that? You know, like in like being real, like, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, but it was, um, didn't really have a huge impact on me one way or the other because you know i was just a seventh grade kid and i wasn't super aware and obviously i was in remedial math so i wasn't really with it at the time i'm not one could still say i'm i'm, I'm still not but like i think at the end of the day it was a thing i only knew it was a big deal because everybody told me it was a big deal and then i was like okay i guess this is a big deal so yeah that's interesting that they brought everybody into all the kids in to watch it like it's it's a um like a mass trauma mass force trauma event right mm -hmm. to where it's like it's almost a ritual i feel like we had the same thing with the challenger explosion i was just about to say i was just about to say but the difference was is like i remember watching the challenger because we were watching it just to watch it and it yeah. exploded well, live. I, I think every school child right it like i think live, every you know. american school child was watching and then the it challenger. makes you wonder i mean i guess this is the conspiracy episode but <laughs> it makes you wonder because i'm sure you guys have seen the pictures of the challenger crew now 
Yeah. That mm-hmm. whole thing that they're right. still alive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if that's the case, it makes you go like, well, maybe it was a mm-hmm. constructed force mass trauma experiment, you know, because mm-hmm. I think one of the things that like, I think one of the things that, that brings into focus for me, how looking back, I, I mean, look, when we talk now in this age of like cynicism and truth or stuff and all that stuff, it's like, for me, the reason why it hits maybe different than some people is because I reflect on being a kid mm-hmm. and I reflect on being, I remember what it means to be naive and innocent and mm-hmm. believing everything that you see on TV mm-hmm. and how that forms and affects you, you know? Um, and then when you realize how, um, incredibly powerful the images that are shown to you and the context in which they're shown and how they shape and form your reality, then you begin to start thinking like, wow, I mean, you know, all of these things, um, cause even like, for instance, <clears throat> excuse me, like I started thinking about how the challenger narrative shaped me as a kid mm-hmm. you know what I mean in this kind of building in I don't know maybe they were seeing the waning of the kind of patriotism in our generation that might have kept us from being good producers you know economically I don't know but it it really kind of it was the first time I ever felt some sort of like patriotism which i don't even know what that you know what i mean like america nasa like you know wanting to recover from something well and forgive me father but wouldn't you say that the narrative around the challenger with christy mcauliffe was that her name mm-hmm. the school teacher, the teacher woman? yeah wouldn't wouldn't you say that like it almost feels like it's the earliest that i can remember of like the seeds of woke almost like diversity, inclusion. Because yeah, there was the black, there was the black astronaut on there, right? Black astronaut on there. It was like the first time, right? Yeah. And then they became martyrs. Yeah. So mm. they were almost like the first martyrs of woke. Yeah. Like they died for the they died for the Church of woke. Yeah. The first saints, in a way. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never thought that's of it like. That's interesting. I don't. I don't know it's the first one that do you remember? Do you remember anything before that where it was so clearly like it was so clearly diversified and staged as we were um, just talking about Marvel and Disney and all of these? Do you do you remember it ever before that? No, no, I don't either. And so much so it's one of those things where this is going to make some people furious. But like you weren't I wasn't even aware of like the need for it. You know what I'm saying? It was yes, like yes. This is what I'm getting at. This it's is like, like okay. <laughs> you know yes. what I mean? Like okay. Well, that's yeah. Crazy. It wasn't. It wasn't even a like. It wasn't even a problem. You know what I mean? Because like I mean, at that time, the school that I was attending. I mean, I was going to school in the hood, so it was like the school was majority minority. Let's put it like that, right? That's I think that right majority minority, right? So. I don't recall, and I, I, it's it wasn't even like we even, it was so unfamiliar, the whole like diversity thing. It was so unfamiliar that no one even thought to celebrate it, if that makes sense. Yeah. That it was like no one even knew that it was something that should be celebrated. Yeah. It was more like a novelty or interesting like, oh, that's interesting. They got a black guy. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. They got a woman. Huh. Yeah. Okay, cool. But it wasn't, nobody was like, oh, this is, yes, so wonderful because they've got a woman, because they've got people of color. And there was nobody even knew to feel that way. Mm -hmm. It's very weird. It's interesting. Very weird. Well, Hmm. I mean, I think that it's it's the same thing. Maybe it's a generational thing. Like maybe each, maybe there's got to be like a, um, oh, what's, maybe there's got to be like a sacrifice every generation. Because it's JFK and the Mm -hmm. Challenger, because everyone remembers where they were with JFK. Now, here's the question. Was JFK the big 
sacrifice or was RFK the big sacrifice? Because like my mom's generation and sort of like the the people who were because she was like a flower child and all that type of stuff. She would always talk about how much more traumatized she was by RFK's assassination. Like Maybe. how he much more represented a useful hope more, much more than anything that JFK ever represented. I, I know w- what my experience is, is that people that I gen- generally talk to much more lament the death of JFK. Mm. And generally that was the, I remember exactly what I was standing in line at cafeteria. At oh, school. right, 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 right. I was getting chocolate milk rather than regular milk. And I was, picking the turkey sandwich rather than the but I think I think some of that though is the fact that he was the president though right as opposed to RFK was seen more for what he was doing like politically you know um in a different way than JFK I think the JFK thing was just like like the president like the president got assassinated like yes all the things that he represented but I, I think that's maybe part of the distinction that's you know, true. there's a like looking at it through a certain lens. Do you remember that part in the Watchmen Father where um, I think it's in the comics too? I know it made it into the movie, but I think it's in the comics. It's been a while since I've read the comic where the comedian is talking to uh, Dr. Manhattan after they've won the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I think if we had lost this war, it would have driven us crazy as a country. Mm-hmm. And, like, Mm. if you kind of look at it through this, like, certain lens, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to, I don't want to be correct on this. I don't want to, like, trace this all the way back. But it seems like since, like, um, maybe since, like, the 60s or something like that with the PSYOP of the counterculture and, Mm -hmm. like, the generally having to push the limitations or push the bar back. It's like, okay, we just coming off World War II hot dog you know and then it's the korean war it's like the first time we have to admit like okay well we didn't really win this one in a clear and definitive way but nobody lost but nobody but at lost. least nobody so lost it's just like this like gentle like the you know the boiling of the water but you had to turn it up like half a degree a year just like nobody is noticing that it is people are noticing but they're not really noticing and then it's the counterculture and then it's jfk and then it's watergate and then not only that, then I'm sure there's other stuff in there, but then there's the challenger exploding. This is gently like revealing like this whole um, nihilism uh, narrative that's trying to be sold is like, yeah, your big beacon of shining hope that is America, which, you know, it was always problematic, is not good. And we're showing you gently why it's not good. But it's kind of like in a controlled manner meant to probably like manipulate and influence people. But I don't know. I'm but but the, so so this is my so this is my thought on that because you bring up World War II. I think the the big the the key with World War II, like the 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 missing of the mark, if we shall say, with World War II and where and I think that this ties back to talking about like being a young being a young immature country as opposed to having a long tradition and a long memory and a long history, especially a long spiritual tradition is walking out of World War II with the idea that, one, that wars can be won, and two, that America won the war, or that anyone won World War II, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Like, I think that 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 has actually been the U.S.'s stumbling block up till now, and only a young country would ever fall for that lie. If anything, the communist won. Like they were the only well, one, but but they they're not around. Like nobody won. Like, well, that's the thing. Like no, but because I don't we, think that the Russians would say, like well, Russians gained, don't say that they won that war. They gained territory, dude. But they lost so many, so many millions of people died. No, no, no. But that's never a factor. Like that's not a factor. War pigs, war pigs by Black Sabbath. That's mm-hmm. not a factor. Like they don't care how many people they sacrifice if they gain territory. You can check that up as a net profit. You but can let me like- just, they just add this to, I just, I just want to throw this in there and let you guys go back at it. But it's important to not just see it as actual territory, like land geography. Mm-hmm. It's, it's influence, both, mm-hmm. you know, influence just in general, because that plays out economically 
And that plays out in regards of power. Because here's the other thing. Remember, let's let's go where we need to go and realize that we're not talking about just the machinations of men. Exactly. Right? Ephesians 6.12. Exactly. So we have to look at what's happening on the on the bigger level, in the principalities, and what's the movement there. And I think that's really important to keep in mind, especially when we start talking about W2, because with W2, you start seeing things that you really couldn't see before. Mm. It's not that they weren't there. It's just that from that, basically from, you know, the... Um, the allied forces and this kind of like into this taking shape, this revelation. Um, and, and, and the problem is to tie this back. I don't know if the right word is the problem to tie it back to what we we're talking about in regards of the kind of opening of the eyes with um, Korea and then like Vietnam mm -hmm. is that the mask in which the principalities were, have been wearing was starting to kind of fall off. Mm. And I think, mm. I think there's people, see, this is part of the problem we get into PSYOP stuff is that people will be like, yeah, the counterculture was a PSYOP and everything's like, um, you know, constructed. And there's truth to that. But the problem with that is, is that's also a trap to, if you fall into it too hard, because it's still looking at just the machinations of man, mm -hmm. right? And the reality is that you have to see how things are being, like geopolitical stuff is never just geopolitical stuff, right? It's never just the machinations of men. Everything is about moving the chess pieces in such a way to make a body, you know? Because a body needs to be made. Um, you know, talking about like Sauron, stuff like that. So I think I just want to say that before we go any further into it, because I think that helps us always to, <clears throat> it's always my, it's always my, not pet peeve, but it's something that I'm always, I mean, we've had this before, Andrew, we're like you and Herman were discussing history. Like, ah, you know, we got to be careful not to just look at history because people want to kick out spirituality when you start talking about history. You know what I'm saying? People want to no. People and want I to think out, they go like, that's not academic and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I mean, it's fine. It may not be academic, but the fact of the matter is, is that that's what's really motivating and moving behind these things, you know? I've talked about this before, so I won't, I won't rant about it. But um, the thing that I generally tell people when it's talking about, it's so, um, I think short-sighted is maybe the word I want to use, but there's probably a better one. Um, it's so short-sighted to take spirituality out of history is when you look at the, um, I know I've talked about this before, the, the how Gabriela Princip's assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Mm -hmm. It was just coincidence after coincidence. Quote, unquote, quote, unquote, unquote, yeah. unquote, 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 mm -hmm. unquote. Um, because it was just there's really no way that that assassination really should have gone down there was so many um things that went into it uh if the main historical narrative is to be believed and you're able to look at that narrative and look underneath the surface and see the gentle like black hands <laughs> pun intended because that's what this is the about to say, really pun intended. yeah yeah, yeah mm -hmm. pun intended um oh the black hand the black I mean, hand gang yeah Okay. So anyway, there it is. Um, kind of pushing the chess pieces, you know, to, um, again, we've talked about this, but I won't go on to literally manifest hell on earth for four years in a kill. Um, what I would argue as being at best an amateur historian at best. And even like the amateur historians, like good friend that hangs out with him at like Ruby Tuesdays or something like that. Like I'm that guy that can like, look at this stuff and be like well yeah it's it's kind of insane the amount of coincidences coincidences that went into that assassination and there's really no reason why it should have gone down the way it did and so um anyway manifesting hell on earth for like four years and then in my opinion killing essentially the old world and monarchies um and ushering and, in the and, and i mean and that's the mm -hmm. thing there too is that 
you know, part of, and I, we're just talking, right? Just having, you know, some tea and cough drops. But um, this whole reality of even, you know, ah, this is going to be tough for people, but consider the convoluted, um, erroneous, evangelical, eschatological paradigm and how it, it's it's just baked into like America and like think about America and what America is in the context of the world in regards of influence and power like you know you need crazy convoluted madness like that dispensationalism that comes out of evangelicalism to really put forward certain ideologies that end with the last letter of the alphabet you know what I'm saying mm. um, and that no. No, I don't know what you mean by that. Go back to that, Father, if you could, for one second. Well, do you, I think you mean start. Do you mean end with the last letter or start with the last letter? Well, excuse me. <laughs> they start with the last letter of the alphabet, right? Enough uh, said. Enough said. Enough said. We'd like to keep our channel. So, so the thing is, is that how do you get that into... How, how do you, I mean, how do you introduce that in such a way again to make a body, right? Because, you know, and again, the, people are getting to the whole the protocols, the last letter of the alphabet, all that stuff. But the reality is that when you look at those movements and now, again, this is the thing. Someone who doesn't understand that could be hearing what we're saying. And, and this is going to be a tough episode because – there's going to be half or maybe a quarter of people that are following us. And then there's going to be half like, what are you talking about? You I'm know? in that half. I'm in that half. Just, yeah. Like, just keep yeah. listening. Just I'm keep listening. listening. You'll get, yeah. you'll get it. You'll um, get it. <laughs> but like, you have to remember that it isn't just enough to have like the principalities. It's not just like, okay, we want this like to happen in a abstract disincarnate way. You have to begin to move things in such a way that it, that it will incarnate, it'll manifest. So like, how do you get money and weapons and all the things, power, influence funneled to certain political, religious ideologies that govern and develop small portions of land in the Levant? You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you, how do, you do that? You have to, you have to go and dismantle the, the 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 monarchies. You have to basically dismantle the body that has been the body of Christ that's in the world, right? Mm -hmm. The body of Christ that's in the world. You, you know, it's like you chop the head, the body falls. Like you get rid of monarchy, and there's gonna be a whole thing, clickety clack. I'm not one of those guys who I'm like, you know, monarchies da 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 da, because like at the end of the day, it's a theocracy, right? But you know. Monarchy and the last Christian monarch, which is the czar, all that needs to happen to fall away, to really begin to allow for one body to fall away so that the man of sin can, can come forward. But in order for the man of sin to come forward, you have to have a body in which he will govern. Now, let me say this. I have been of the mindset a lot lately that, and I, you know, it's, we're all just, it's all speculation. We're just, this is just, you know, tea and cough drops, but Islam in particular, here we go. Islam in particular, I, ha I have come more and more to see the parallels and the connection points is gonna this is gonna drive some people crazy. Islam, Judaism, and Protestantism have connecting threads that I don't think people realize. Hmm. Well, the so I will I will say this for people who are like like might be confused about that. Um, for people who don't know the history of Muhammad, when he was chased out of Mecca. After he after being after everybody was like, this dude's crazy. And even he thought he was possessed by demons when he was chased out of Me Mecca. He was chased to Yathrib, which is now called Medina. 
And who lived at Yathrib? It was all Arab Jews. It was a completely Jewish community. And the, he survived because he became there. They had a, I forget what the name for it is, but because they have no central um, authority over them, because they have no monarch and they're all individual tribes, who sits at the top is basically like a judge who adjudicates intertribal disputes. And because he was an outsider and he wasn't a member of any of those tribes and he was a pretty smart guy, he was a caravan commander and all this, he came and he came from wealth, they made him their judge. And so it's just, it's so interesting to me that like, if you really just take the historical context under which this guy is making these pronouncements and everything, it's with, it's, it's completely Jewish influence. It's Jewish. He's a Jewish judge. He's a judge over Jews. Mm -hmm. And he comes up with a moral system under which he judges them. So it really is, it's kind of, it is Judaism kind of. And there's, it's going to come about in such a way that the reconciliation between those two, it's going to be like, oh, duh, why didn't we see it? Right. But you know who can't be reconciled? Actual Christians. Yep. Actual Christians cannot be reconciled. We, I mean, that's the thing. And so that's why getting into part of the distraction, I think some of the trap is that people are, are and, and again, um, the, the descendants of Jacob and their nation, <laughs> Um, and 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 that particular political articulation of that nation of Jacob, right? Um, which you know the letter Z. People are are very easily distracted and fixated on that, and begin to be like, "Oh, see, this is this is where all this stuff is going to come." But I think where a lot of people are sleeping is they don't see how Islam and Judaism in particular, you know, that, that, that specific articulation of Judaism are actually way more reconcilable than I think people realize. Um, well, and evangelical millennialist Protestantism. Because the... evangelicals are essentially, they treat, evangelicals are more in the disposition of Muslims than they are Catholics. 100%. 100%. I mean, the way that they look at the scriptures is the way that Muslims look at the Quran, mm -hmm. their, their iconoclasm, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, on and oh, on. Oh, yeah, I never really thought yeah. about that, but yeah. it's like, oh, are, are you Muslim? Like, what is yeah. this? You're, you're not, yeah. you can't make images? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Evangelicals are more like Muslims in many ways. Even think about how rigid they are mm -hmm. in certain and how rigid they are and how that rigidity plays out in all these different ways. The the interface of evangelicalism with the world looks a lot more like Islam than it does traditional Christianity. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? Traditional Christianity mm -hmm. baptizes. Traditional mm -hmm. Christianity because it because it's the body of Christ, right? Evangelicalism mm -hmm. approaches it like Islam does, like the sword. Um, and so I find it really fascinating because mm. the reality of how, um, even like the narrative of conservatism and evangelical conservatism that's mm. tied to, let me kind of, let me try to bring us on home. That's tied to these very particular um, eschatological expressions. I was just about to say their eschatology is so in line with each other. Because what happens is eschatology for the evangelical and for the Muslim takes the place of authentic spiritual mystic, mystic experience and mysticism, right? So you, you couch it firmly in an eschatological kind of paradigm which only has its manifestation in the sociopolitical period, right? Yes. yes. There is no allegorical, anagogical understanding of history. No, no mystical connection to Zero. anything. 
Zero. Now, people are going to clickety-clack, and, okay, I'm not really talking about Sufism right here. Yeah, but Sufism is not really Islam. It, and let's, be, let's be real. Sufism is, is the shoehorn. Yeah, right. Sufism is the shoehorn that's going to that's gonna slide it in for all the people who are, like, not hearing what I'm saying. Yeah. Because you'll call Sufism, see, we have mysticism, we have whatever. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But when you look at it, this is this is this is a big thing because <clears throat> excuse me, the movements now of um conservatism are really beginning more and more, I don't want to say to ape Islamic talking points, but they are definitely becoming more and more um they're orbiting the same type of mindset. And it's really dangerous because the temptation is you can see for so many Christians now, it's like for, for Christians who, who don't, for Christians who don't who basically don't have Christ as their King. Boom. This is going to make a lot more sense. And it, it's, it's what we saw happen with, um, uh, Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't the only one. There's been that whole manosphere. Yeah. The, the, the move into Islam mm-hmm. for them. Mm-hmm. And and I think when when you look at you know they have that format that that was the like the fresh and fit format but it's just like the format they bring on a bunch of, I say they bring on a bunch of hoes forgive me for that but that's the, you know what I mean they bring on a bunch of wanton women and then they get some guy and that guy is usually he's one of two things he's either like an evangelical Christian or he's a or, or he's a Muslim mm. and then he tells them how terrible they are. Mm-hmm. Right. He just sits there and tells them how irredeemable they are, how horrible their life is, all of these things, how everything's going to be terrible for them. And it is interesting to me that it's it's they sound the same. Mm-hmm. You can't tell like if you just got the transcript, mm-hmm. you wouldn't be able to tell whether this was a Muslim speaking or whether this was an evangelical Protestant. I mean, speaking. even think about how the world the world is positioning to approach it. Let's take, let's take Peterson, right? I remember a couple months ago when Peterson was doing the whole thing, he was like giving his messages to different traditions, right? And he wanted, <laughs> to, make sure, so ridiculous. He wanted to make sure that he had costed and chastised and made sure the Christians knew they were missing the point. Oh, the anti-epistles or whatever. Yeah. But like the Muslims, he was like, Hey, you know what? He's, he's, at that point in time, he's really trying to ingratiate himself to the Muslims and the Jews. I mean, he was on his knees for them. So, oh yeah. So you see that he, being this um, kind of like ambassador of the neo traditional quote unquote conservative, right? Who's looking to employ and to resurrect, resuscitate all the beauty and value of the Western tradition and present it in such a way where the mistakes have been made, but we are a people speaking, you know, Westerners, we are a people of rationalism, of intellect and profound culture. We're not barbarians. We accept you, right? We, we, you know, trying to be this kind of like connective tissue, if you will. And, the problem is, of course, right? The problem is, is that for a lot of people who are Christians slash Orthodox, they get that and they want to they want to kind of join in on that in the right way. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. If you are an Orthodox Christian and if you're Christian in general and you don't have Christ as your King, you can do that. But if you do, you can't. That's why when you look at all these movements, including fascism, um, and I mean that in a very clinical sense, you have a real problem. You have a real problem because ultimately, at best, you have people giving a lip service to Christ as mythology and this and this and that. And when it comes down to it, you're either going to give the pinch of incense or you're you're out. You know what I mean? Um, And I just think that Excuse me, as we move forward now, it's like I was having this conversation about being in London 
and being in the UK. And um, I can't remember who I was speaking with. They were like, oh, you know, then if it's like so atheist and godless. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I didn't feel that. I actually felt a lot of spirituality. He just wasn't Christian. There, you know what I mean? It just, you could feel the spirit. Well, London is packed, packed full of uh, Indians. You could feel I mean, there's a ton of, and Muslims. <laughs> you could feel the spirit of Islam and you could feel that, that kind of, uh, I don't want to say new age, because we say new age here, we think yoga pants and like whatever. I mean, new age in the sense of the syncretic perennialism mindset. That's, that's like, you feel that. So I didn't feel an absence of like religion there. I felt actually a very heavy spirit of that, of a perennialism, you know? And I think that's one of the things where when you start looking, getting back to history and you start understanding, well, what's the, well, what are the moves? What's the strategy that's being laid out, you know? And the move, if you don't see it, and I think this is this is just speculation again, tea and cough drops. But one of the things that's tough for people when they want to go from a people want to look at this and they go like, okay, what do the fathers say? They want a patristic approach. The problem with it is a lot of the fathers who are speaking from an eschatological point of view, they're writing before or at the advent of Islam. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know what I'm saying? So it's like people are like, oh, it's like the fathers didn't, they, they didn't see Islam coming. You know what I mean? But now that it's here, right, and it's here, here, and you see that, like, what do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about the birth rate? Do you want to talk about birth rate? I mean, I remember uh, there was, um, I can't remember what his name was. He was an elder from Athos. And he came to Southern California to speak. He spoke at um, St. Andrew's, Father Josiah's church. And I remember having a conversation with someone the following weekend. I think it might have been Kevin Allen, rest in peace. Um, but he brought up a really great point. So there was a woman there in the audience who asked the elder, I can't remember what the elder's name was, forgive me, um, what do we do about Islam? And she's really worked up. What do we do about Islam? Really worked up. And so the person I was speaking with relayed, he's like, it was really great. This is him, the way he's explained it. It's really great because the elder didn't respond in energy. He just kind of sat back really quiet, looked around, and he said, his answer was, Christians should have more babies. Mm. And this was in like, this was, someone can click and clack, this was in like 2002, two, uh, two, maybe 2003 when this happened. This this elder was at St. Andrews. So <clears throat> I remember hearing that back then um, and being like, huh, that's very interesting. Because that same year, though, though I'm going somewhere with this, that same year, Kevin Allen did interview someone. I don't want to say the name. He interviewed someone um, who's the brother of a very prominent figure um, in, a, in that archdiocese. And I, I think I was like one of the only few people who caught this. And Kevin Allen asked the guy, he was asking him about Islam. The guy was a Lebanese. And he's like, basically, this guy who's a very related to a very prominent figure was basically saying, like, yeah, Islam's a, 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 a religion of revelation, just like Christianity and whatever. And I remember Kevin going, like, excuse me? Or did you just say Islam's a book of uh, a, a, a revealed religion and Christianity and Judaism was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember Kevin just dropped it and like, good on Kevin. Kevin was such a good interviewer because he knew when not to push something. But I remember hearing that in the same season as hearing that elder give that speech. Well, why am I, why am I talking about this? At that point in my life, this is past, excuse me, this is post 9-11. And for me, that was the advent of my eyes being, oh, my eyes opening to Islam and what it was. It didn't, I didn't have any real context. And especially like for me, it's like the only context I had was like Farrakhan and like the nation of Islam and stuff like that. But then coming to the church and hearing these things and, 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 and within a matter of months of each other, I'm like, 
wow, that's really heavy. So the reason why I'm saying all that is because how do you want to look at this? Do you want to look at the fact that how, I mean, how is it growing? Right. It, it, I mean, do you want to look at babies? Do you want to look at the the? It's, the, it's demographic. It's demographic, demographic growth. It's act, it's actual bodies being actual brought into existence. Population. Yeah. yeah. But then, yeah. but then there's another side of it too, which is influence, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's mm-hmm. the uh, and then there's the obvious, which I mean, the age of conquest uh, that remains to be seen, mm-hmm. right? But like, I think this is really important to, to see because, look, you know, one, we're all just talking again for the fifth time tea and cough drops but you know get to when you know it's super unsober and like we're not we're just having a conversation but the Madi right the Madi looks a lot like RAC yep oh I'm we're gonna ask what the Madi was yeah the Madi looks their messiah yeah at the end of the day at the end of days and it looks a lot like RAC and when you think about, because here's the other thing, I was thinking about this, <clears throat> you know, some of the narrative that we've been having about like, oh, you know, okay, the woke, so I just like, man, like, the quicker we get off the woke thing and just realize that ain't it, the better. It's, that's such a distraction. That's, that's just a, like, that's a tool. It's just like breaking the door down because the, the majority mm-hmm. of the world is not down with that. So mm-hmm. since the majority of the world is not down with that, then what are you working with, right? Well, you're, well you're... but f- Father, Father, forgive me. The majority of the world is not down with it, but, and I don't think was ever down with it, but it, it's been a wonderful tool for destabilization because it got a lot of people to buy into something that was then going to be broken anyway. So it's almost like they got everybody to be like, okay, I'm in with this, in with this. I'm in with this ideology and then knowing that it's going to that it's standing on sand and that those people are going to when they fall, it's like they'll be easily taken by something else. And I think yeah, that's I mean, kind of where you're going with it. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be getting into like the Hegelian dialectic. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, exactly. You know, it, you really needed something. I mean, here's here's the thing. I'm sure like we're like everything popped off. Um, in Israel, when when like we were on hiatus, right? Because I was like at the monastery, we're not all happy, whatever. <laughs> Excuse me. And like, I mean, since we're just gonna talk about it, I'm sure everyone knows by now. But there's some things that no one's. I mean, there's some things that I've heard in a couple places. But I I just want to throw out a couple things for people to think about. You know what I mean? Just a couple things. Like I don't know how many people realize how. Um, disunified the Israeli society was prior to that. You know what I'm saying? It's oh, they're, like, they're about to have a revolution, actually. They're, they're, about they're to very close to it. And that's why it's like, yeah, it was their 9-11 moment, getting back full circle to 9-11. You know, obviously not planned, right? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Like, it is their 9-11, and it is their Reichstag, right? Because the, the, 9-11 was our Reichstag to some degree. And that was, the, and this is their Reichstag. Like nine eleven is just under the word for the Reichstag, right? Um, and this, everyone knows the Reichstag. Yeah, right? I was just going to say the Reichstag being the burning down of the Reichstag, the German government, which allowed Hitler to basically claim a bunch of power. It's commonly as a term used by people as a uh, as a, a an event and a an uh, inspiring event to unify a country and maybe grant powers to people who don't. Well, and them. usually an inside job. And usually it's, people usually are referring to it as operation. an inside job. Yes, black flag, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that alone, we could just talk about that. Never mind all the other like incidentals of like security and all that stuff. But the reason why, the reason why I'm bringing all this up is because, again, you know, it, it's funny how everything's like shifting in, in hindsight, it's 2020, right? Um, but when you start thinking about like, look at how quickly the groundswell has come for people to really rally around Palestine and um, and 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 I think this is super important, right? <laughs> Excuse me, because like everything else, people are so ignorant and they don't understand. It's like me watching. You know, 
uh, a trans feminist, like whatever, like ultimate woke person, quote unquote, really kind of like supporting Hamas and things like that. It's just, it's, 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 it's incredible. It's incredible. It's incredible because it's like, oh, by the way, you're one of the first people they'll, they're going to they kill. kill you. Yeah. Well, father, father, for, for, they'll forgive kill you. me. They'll kill you. In a soccer stadium, while everyone cheers on, they will be hedged. Forgive me, because speaking of people being killed and things that are that seem idiosyncratic in this whole thing, and something that it doesn't seem like I really am hearing people address that's in the same vein, Father, is you know the big martyrs on whose bones you know, this operation has been launched for the most part for people in the West, like the people that I know who they're upset about is they're upset about the people who were attacked at the music festival. You know, they flew in, they attacked this music festival. And then they now if you've seen videos of the music festival, it's like it's it's Burning Man style. So it's Burning Man style. Never mind the coincidence of what just weirdly happened at Burning Man where they weren't able to burn the man and everything. But it's like a little miniature Burning Man, okay, on the Sabbath. A lot of Jews didn't even know, like Ben Shapiro talks about the fact that he didn't even really know what Mm -hmm. was going on with the attack because it was the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And so he had to wait to even watch a television, right? Mm -hmm. These people are partying on the Sabbath, probably doing drugs as well. Right. Probably some drinking out no, there and everything. Not. Right. At, no. a, at a, at a no. music. But it's a it's a peace festival. And I was just like, yo, isn't there something weird about. A Jewish nation. Writing as martyrs, a bunch of people who are doing exactly what they're they not shouldn't supposed be doing to be doing on the Sabbath. Listen, so, like. Wouldn't a real Jew be like, well, that's what you get for doing that on the listen, Sabbath? Like, wouldn't, listen, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just listen, saying, man, I'm just saying. Listen, <laughs> listen, listen, and this is this is the thing. Like, when okay, getting back to the evangelical who has been conditioned and brainwashed to support. And by support, I mean to give manifestation to, you know, to build a body for, you know, this uh, socio-political religious ideology that ends with the last, that begins the last letter of the alphabet, right? Like, when you realize that they are, they, (laughs) it's, 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 it's not even a secular state. Like that, that it's it's not even that good, right? I mean, listen, we could start getting into Kabbalah and like all that stuff and what it really means and where it's really coming from. And like, I'm just saying, people don't realize how demonic Judaism is. And so the thing is, is here's the other thing, because people have bought into this and like you have so many Orthodox who are evangelical converts and it's one of the last things if ever that gets touched when people convert right they they just they just they they don't touch it but the thing is is people don't realize they go like yeah 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 Judaism like no 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 Judaism is a false demonic (laughs) religion because why because we're Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, like, the, the, like, fork, like, the fork happened. The, everybody who stayed on this end of the fork, yes. it's the demons. There's no question. <laughs> That's We're, it. We are Israel. Mm-hmm. So then you get into this whole, like, shifting and moving eschatology, mm-hmm. which shifting, moving, and producing eschatological strains mm-hmm. is all about revision of history, by the way. Mm-hmm taking names and don't move the ancient landmarks as the scripture says, that's mm-hmm. all a part of that. Right. And so what so many evangelical, what all evangelicals don't understand is when they think of Judaism, they think like, Oh yeah, this is just like, you know, you know, the sons of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And it's like, no, it's not like, mm-hmm. right. No, it's not. And so, well, and, and father, forgive me. It's, it, 
by definition, it actually can't even be the Judaism practiced by the people at the time of Christ because there's no temple. There's no sacrifice. There's, they don't, they're not yeah. sac- like Christ, Jesus went and he overturned the money changers temples and the benches of those who were selling doves. That's for the sacrifice. Mm-hmm. They don't sacrifice yeah. doves anymore, meaning they don't even practice whatever that religion was. They don't practice it anymore. And of course they don't because that religion because, is gone. And, and so, and so let, <laughs> let's connect another strain, right? What came up out of the ashes of, you know, God laid, God leveled it. God destroyed it, right? Because the, because the Messiah came, right? So what came out of the ashes? Rabbinic Judaism, right? That's right. And That's what right. is rabbinic Judaism but the precursor of Islam? That's exactly what it is. <laughs> it's, it's right. That's rabbinic exactly Judaism what it is. Judaism is the precursor of Islam. Right. You can draw the line direct. I mean, I just drew it, but it's like you, you can draw it. the line directly. You look at the praxis, you look at the the mm-hmm. metaphysics, you look at all this, just like that's it's 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 all there. Mm-hmm. And evangelicalism is the antichrist of allowing Christ to participate in that system. Right? You can't have this whole like, oh, the three of Muhammad, the three um uh, Abrahamic faiths, like the only way you can have that is be- is because of Protestant evangelicalism, period. Because orthodoxy, real orthodoxy, not the kind that's going to be compromised by whatever, by the world perennial system. Real orthodoxy is like, no, this can't work. Like it has nothing to do. Like it's just, it's, it's, it's so separate. But Islam, evangelicalism, Judaism, they all have that, hey, we have the book, right? They have the book. What is a book of? What is a book? A book is, this is why for us, it's like, mm, 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 mm. you can burn all the Bibles, baby. We still exist. Right. The book, a book in this sense, is is a symbol of man's authority, of man's own self-divinization, if you understand it in this mm-hmm. context, right? In the context that, they're, in the context that in the those context three they use it. it. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because the book mm-hmm. takes the place of the person. That's right. That's why evangelicalism, Protestantism is so important because you need to have someone that's able to, you can't completely kick Christ out. You need to find a way to make him fit, quote unquote, and the coming world system of the beast, Bismillah, (laughs) by the way, Bismillah. So you do this by presenting a Christianity that, that it's incarnational, aspect is tied to something that is parallel or to some degree subservient to the the image of man meaning the book the book is a, the book is a tool used by man so evangelical christian Father, forgive me straight out of book of eli you're going you're going gary oldman straight out oh. of book of eli right now right where he's yeah. like if i have the book yeah if i just could have the book if you have I the could book, control everybody if I have the that's book. It. That's it. Because if you have the book, right, that's that's how many evangelicals? The Bible's the word of God. The Bible, like, yeah, the word of oh, God. Oh, Father, a Bible-based church, and they say it unironically. Like, wait a right. minute, a Bible based what are you talking? How could how could the Bible that tells that is a telling the story of the church? How could your church, how could the church be based on the Bible? True, the Bible is based on the church. <laughs> let me tell you a true story. In a Sunday school room, I remember looking at a thing. In the beginning was the word, and it's a Bible floating in space. Wow. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Stop. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's your Bible-based church. There's, there's the, the there's the demonic, church. there's the demonic image of the Bible-based church right there. So, <laughs> is, so father is the islamic faith is um or is is the faith of is the muslim faith fairly gnostic then is it like is it pretty like do they separate do, is there like a separation of reality that that we kind of see in the gnostic heresy um uh, maybe of like like um this isn't like the actual representation like do you know what i mean like are you could you answer that question are you comfortable answering that question because i would just be that question okay first of all i just want to make sure everyone understands 
I'm I'm by no means an expert on 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 Islam, right? But I know enough of the dogmatic tenets of Islam and its history to be like, no, for this reason, blah 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 blah. But when you get into that, it's like I'm not really comfortable answering that, and I'm sure. No worries. I didn't mean to derail the conversation. No, I don't think it's. I don't think that's really necessary in the sense that like. We can say Gnostic in the sense of like Gnosis and like the 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 knowledge being the thing, right? And and knowledge not not knowledge in the sense of how we would understand it, you know. But yeah. and I know there's people who are like, no, 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 and I'm sure there's all these beautiful aspects to it, but I'm just telling you. Are we, there though? Well, I mean, I, I feel like the beautiful aspects that where people say the beautiful aspects of Islam, I feel like those are all the beautiful aspects that Jeez. existed that existed in the cultures that Islam then yeah. took over. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not like yeah. it was in the cultures. It wasn't it wasn't in Islam. And, that, and, that, so. and that's and that's the great distinction, because, again, you know, it's like. One of the one of the most beautiful um, traditions and facets of, of the faith is, you know, um, the Church of Antioch, you know, and, you know, the, the, the beautiful Arabic chant, you know, and this the way that it's, you know, kind of just been robed in the Byzantine tradition and it's really found its expression. Like, there you go. Like, Christ is baptized, you know what I'm saying? Um, but that's pre Muslim. Well, it's not like that about, is, it's pre-Muslim. It's pre-Muslim. It's pre-Christian. It, and it's not even about Islam. It's just about the exactly. culture. Exactly. It's about, it's exactly. about that exactly. culture. Exactly. You know and, and this mm -hmm. gets us back to the same thing where it's just like, look, all this talk about like, well, the fathers were anti-Semitic. It's like, yo, I, people don't even know what they're talking about when they say Semitic because it's like when people, there's this weird, well, we get in this whole thing when it happened. Um, but the reality is, is that the Judaism being syn synonymous with Semitic culture is problematic, right? It's problematic. Well, in 2023, it is. 2023. Maybe in maybe in the year 20, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Or in the year 23, it wasn't. But in 2023, <laughs> it definitely is. <laughs> and it's 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 a setup, right? It's a setup because the fathers aren't the fathers. Yeah, look. When someone says the fathers are anti-Semitic, you know, and they go there, oh, Saint Nicholas, Saint John Chrysostom, blah blah. It's like, look, they're talking about a religion, people. They're talking about a religion. They're not talking about a people group in that sense, you know. So, all of that though being said, it's like, I just, I can't help but feel that, as much as people want to find themselves, um you know, kind of like on one side or the other, like everything is about the polemic, right? And and the polarized polemic of like left, right, you know, um, Islam, Israel, all stuff. But like, yo, it's the same. <laughs> it's, it, we're basically looking at a Democrat, Republican thing. I know that's, I know that's crazy for people to hear that. But if you stop and really think about who Christ is and you start really thinking about all these similarities right all these things where if we were really honest about it and if, if, if well if we were honest about it and then with that honesty went to have maybe some some dishonest intentions or God's manipulation we could build a pretty good campaign for joining forces with we could, we could have a good campaign for a conservative coalition re, for a religiously speaking of traditions, right? Um, Jordan and, Peterson would like to try. Yeah, and, and is trying, you know? But the ones who can't be in there, we can't be in there. And that's why this gets us full circle with like, you know, it's not about being ecumenical, but the ecumenism that's so dangerous is that... Um, you, you can have an Islam that allows for Judaism and Christianity, but you can't have a Christianity that allows for Judaism and Islam. Like the true Christianity, because the true Christianity is like, look, 
Jesus Christ is God. That simple. It's, it's that simple. It's that simple. <laughs> it's that simple. It's that simple. The, the Christ that I've heard, or the Jesus that I've heard be presented in Islam doesn't sound very much like Christ. Like it, like the nature and the character by which he is presented as a prophet rather than God, it just doesn't sound like Christ. But it's you like, want you want to hear something interesting though? In one way that he does sound like Christ, that seems that's that's one thing that should make everybody be like, and I don't know why it's not something where more people are like, wait, there's something wrong here. So at the end, their eschatology is that at the end of days, there's this character, Dajjal, who they say that's like their antichrist, but he's the enemy, right? And he's going to come down and he's going to come into Jerusalem with all, with the Gog and Magog and all this type of stuff. And then the Mahdi is going to get his army from out of Persia and he's going to bring them through Arabia and they're all going to be there. And then they're going to set up at, I believe they set up in Jerusalem. I don't think it's in Mecca. They set up in Jerusalem and get ready to fight. No, they set up in Mecca and get ready to fight. And in Jerusalem, Jesus comes back. In Jerusalem, Jesus comes down through the, the Dome of the Rock, and he comes back, and he heads off to Mecca. And in the morning, the Mahdi is praying with his army before fighting Dajjal, and Christ shows up in the body to fight with them. And he goes out, and he kills Dajjal with the spear, and then he teaches everyone Islam. And I'm like, hold on. Hold on. If you spend all this time telling me Christ is not God, he's just a prophet. Jesus is just a prophet. How does he come back at the end of days in the body and fight on alongside the Mahdi? Does any other prophets come back? How come just this one particular prophet? Does Abraham come back? Does Moses have the ability to come back and fight? Why don't they all come back and fight for the Mahdi? What makes Jesus different? What makes Christ different? And they can never answer that question. Why doesn't Muhammad come back? Muhammad is, is the last prophet, right? He doesn't come back. Christ comes back. And it's just like, what's going on here? What's going on here? Y'all are going to have to explain something to me because this seems like you guys got something wrong here. Yeah. That even Muhammad had to admit. And he's, it's right in there. Christ, Jesus Christ is God. That's it. Because only God could do that. There was a... They can never a... answer that. They can never answer that, by the way. And that's their eschatology. I don't understand it. Doesn't make any sense, right? I understand it. I understand it. <laughs> there was um, a story that the very first Orthodox priest I ever like talked to, um, they were having like a Bible study thing, and they were sitting at like, I don't know, like IHOP or something like that. Um, the pancake place, not the prayer place. And um the a Muslim dude walked by and he like pointed at each one of their Bibles was like, that's a different translation from that's a different translation. That's a different. He's like, and he pulled out what I assume was the Quran or whatever and said, there's only one translation of this. And like, I remember like, cause you guys talking about the book who has the book and it's like, well, sure, I guess, I guess, but also at the same time, it's like, you know, our church didn't even have a Bible. For like 250 years and yet we thrived so i mean what does that say about the faith what does that say about our two different faiths is this is like your big like coup de gras against like this orthodox priest who's sitting here with a couple of his parishioners like i find it wanting like it's not a solid argument and it's not like a solid point to be made but but it well, is a solid it, point to be made to an evangelical i was i was just about to say that yes. yeah i was yeah. just about to say that. yes yeah it's just about to and see, it. he knew their weakness was in their book. Yeah. Because their whole thing is based on a on a book and it gets not on it, Christ. And it and it gets to this whole thing, which we are always so guilty of, man. Saul's armor doesn't fit. Yeah. Saul's armor doesn't fit. We always want to fight on other people's playing grounds and rules and, and in their arenas. It's like we shouldn't even be having that question in regards of like the book. You know what I'm saying? St. Mary of Egypt. She Saint said, Mary. I've never read scripture and I've never even have it heard it read to me. St. Mary of Egypt. Like, what do you want? That's it. For me, I'm like, well, that's it. That says it all right there. <laughs> Someone wrote a question to St. Nikolai and it was about the dwindling resources of the earth. 
and they're like should i be worried like fa like father what do we do you know like what what do we how do we handle this like how do and you know because the earth is going to run out of stuff we're going to overpopulate the planet and saint nikolai's response is perfect he's just like because it encapsulates so much of like what we're talking he's like what are you talking about like what are you talking about what an odd thing to be worried about like this is like yeah. this is not a thing like which like, is which i will say this though I, I love that transition andrew thank you because that gets me to think about this other thing i was just speaking about this with someone um yesterday day for yesterday which is kind of looping back to this little thing about christians should have more babies right boy oh boy oh boy um one of the things that i find really compelling and someone can clickety clack and be like actually these things are all you know kind of fabricated numbers okay and i'm i'm open to that right but bar these numbers being fabricated one of the things that's really interesting and convincing for me are the population rates among the particular you know western but orthodox you know just and just christian in general the only place where christians are even slightly growing is is uh population wise um is in what it, what do they call that it's the south um the global south latin america the global south latin america and africa, africa mm -hmm. and southeast asia yeah like and not and like barely southeast asia and i really shouldn't even mention it that's it mm -hmm. that's it and what's interesting about that is so much of that are charismatics yeah and that's a whole other thing in itself right that's a whole well, especially thing. in Africa. Forgive me, Father. Africa is yeah. like just permeated by the charismatic yeah. movement. Yeah. And that's a whole other thing by itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I find that really fascinating because speaking of St. Nikolai, other fathers teach it. But St. Nikolai is an easier one for me to point to who explicitly taught this about, you know, the 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 turning over of everything. When is the vineyard done? Right? Like Christ hasn't come yet. Why? Because the vineyard isn't ready yet. Well, what's the vineyard? The vineyard is when the the number of uh, Christians replaces the rank that fell. Rank of angels that fell. Yeah. Right? So if you start thinking about like, okay, well, just by proxy of, you know, lack of uh, population growth, Right. Um, there comes a point where, you know, I, I think there's I think there's factors that maybe aren't as explicit that could uh, contribute to what we would understand as, you know, the second coming, which is <clears throat> if there's no more Christians, if there's no more Christians being made, whether through baptism or through, excuse me, or through um, a baptism period, right? Whether it's a baby or a convert, or whatever, then there's not, there's no reason for the world to go on, because the world exists. That man would, you know, why, why do we exist, right? So for you know, Saint uh, Roman Braga says, man, God wants someone to talk to. You know what I mean? It's like if there's no more Christians being made, then like, okay, it's a wrap. Let's do this. And if there's no more Christians being made. That's not because God's like, oh, I don't know what's happening. It's like God knows the numbers, right? So God allows all these things to come because it's like, okay, well, you know, that, that number is getting pretty close here for that ninth rank that fell. So I think that's something really interesting to look at because <clears throat> in light of everything that we're talking about, this is no different than COVID and everything else is, look, man, God isn't like, oh, my gosh, I didn't foresee Islam coming. Oh my gosh, I didn't foresee COVID coming. Oh my gosh, I didn't foresee transgenderism coming. It's like, no, all these things are allowed to come because number one, man's lack of repentance. When man doesn't repent, what does God do? God doesn't need to come down and be angry, right? God just goes, okay, cool. This is what you want to do. I'll step back. And when God does do something, it's for it's for chastisement, right? Because God loves us, right? Until his, until his spirit won't strive with, uh, with the flesh of man anymore. Now, there's that aspect, but then the other aspect of it is, is like, well, 
and for coming to a place where it's like, okay, folks, you know, like this, this show's getting ready to wrap. Now the problem is we hear this. It's like, that doesn't mean next weekend. Right. Cause I would just throw this out too. remember something, peace, peace, then sudden destruction. That's why I like, don't sweat. Like people shouldn't sweat too hard. Like, biting their fingernails about what's happening in Gaza and everything. It's like, don't, don't, don't sweat that because it's when everything is like, Hey, we, man, we got this. We figured it out. Yep. It's peace, yep. blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, that's when you start biting your fingernails. Yeah. And that comes at the expense of what, right? And I see that that's really the trans, the tr- true chan- transhumanist agenda is all about this, it's like almost like a dune, like the like the God Emperor idea, mm-hmm. like the golden path or whatever, that mm-hmm. it's like to have this nothing happens. Mm-hmm. Like this stability mm-hmm. of no tension, of no suffering, of no anything. And you're just like uh just drugged out, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And that's the real and that's such a demonic vision. Mm-hmm. That is a demonic. And they're, they're but that's people. peace. That's peace though. That's world peace. <laughs> You know? I mean, I think that there are people who are really thirsting for that too. They're oh, really so like, many. yeah, that sounds much nicer. That sounds my, much nicer than what we got going on now. And I mean, drooling in front of um, TV or a phone, you know, for hours on end. I think that like that's like, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times I think that people choose that. You know, it, it's just like this. Um, I was just talking with someone about this. And I was talking about um, the end of Brave New World. And I was talking about how, like, the guy, they're basically like, well, you're choosing pain. You're, you're, you're like, you're yes. choosing suffering. Yep. And, like, I was talking to him about that. And I was like, you know, I'm not like, um, what's the word? The, the Catholics who walk around with the... Flagellant. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not one yeah. of those. <clears throat> but I think the whole thing is, is that, like, if you are... Um, if you're signing up for life, then you got to sign up for the good stuff and the bad stuff. And if you're signing up for the bad stuff, that's going to involve turmoil and that's going to involve like inner tension. And that's really going to involve you having to put in some work and putting down the phone. And I know I'm guilty of it where it's like, mm-hmm. um, when God calls me to maybe move forward a little bit and I have to like really shake off the cobwebs and the rust and like really like kind of you know, shake a leg a little bit and kind of get moving. <clears throat> it's not fun, but it's ultimately more fulfilling. But that's not a message that's like um, sexy or romantic. So the only thing that it's it's like um, that part of your brain that generates pleasure can only do it so much. Mm-hmm. At a certain point, yeah, yeah, you you're done. Like you need to do something to kind of rebuild that chemical back up well or you chase the dragon right but that's the thing right but so it's not even like they can offer pleasure what they can offer is nothing which is just this whole best they can offer brain zonked out vegetable like Mm -hmm. state in which you have ceased to be much like on a like on on a on a metaphysical level nothing more than a giant bowl of like tapioca pudding and it's like, well, you're just kind of sitting there collecting flies, but hey, at least you don't feel pain anymore, right? Like, at least you're not suffering anymore, right? Like, this is the best that we can do. Um, and he's so. definitely coming back at that point. Like at that point, it's like Christ is like, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming back now. To like for Father absolute Turbo. sure. <laughs> to quote <laughs> Father Turbo, it's already here. It's already it's here. Already this is true. Here. It is like, here. It is don't here. Look for another. This is it. <laughs> like. <laughs> What's crazy to me is that this this is what's crazy. People still don't understand. Like, I get it. And and anyone who hears this and if you feel it's it's there's so many people who struggle with this, so there isn't one person who can feel like I'm throwing you under the bus, right? I'm just saying this thing of like you're tired of me talking to you about suffering. Guess what? That's what it means to be God. That I mean, he shows us that, right? Listen, it's real simple. We don't need to be, this doesn't, this isn't some sort of abstract, whatever. Let's just think about this. If it could have been done any other way, it would have been done that way. Lord, Father, if it's not your will, you know, if it's your will, may this come pass for me. But nevertheless, 
not my not my will be done, but yours. Okay. If it could have been any other way, it would have been done that way. God shows us what it means to be divine and what it means to be human. I mean, forgive me, like that's that's the whole thing, right? And it's and it's in that tension of actually living life. Because the tapioca pudding is not it. That's Satan's way. Satan's like, why does it gotta be that way? Can't you just tell them to do whatever? Can't you just make it whatever? Why has it gotta be this way? Don't go to the cross. Right? No, no kneel down, kneel down before him. No. Kneel down before kneel down before Satan and he'll just make it make you tapioca pudding. Make no problem. Tapioca pudding. That, and that's that's what it means. So when people are like, well, why do I gotta suffer? Why does it gotta be so hard? Because just on a simple level, that's what God shows us what it means. Mm-hmm. And and the thing is, is like in that you begin to discover all these mysteries and all the stuff, but like you have to go through that first. You know what I mean, what's the only place where the mysteries can be discovered? It's like you only- certainly can't deliver them. You certainly can't discover them in pleasure. I mean, as a as a longtime professional hedonist, I can tell you that right now. There's no mysteries to be found there. There is no zero isn't growth. It crazy, isn't it crazy how much hedonism just depletes you and kills you? Oh, it's poison. People don't That's how I describe it. I describe it to people as poison. Like, and I, I it, yeah, think oh. about a fentanyl addict. Think about mm-hmm. what's going down in South Philly and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. That's your hedonism. Mm-hmm. That people, think about Skid Row. That mm-hmm. is your hedonism. That's just like, I just want pleasure mm-hmm. all the time. I don't want any discomfort. Mm-hmm. That's that's hell. That's what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Man, it is too. I mean, what is it? There's like, um, there's like some kind of new drug. I don't, I don't really know if it, maybe it's fentanyl. I'm not sure, but it makes you like crouch. Trank. Like, what's that? Trank. Trank. Fentanyl does that too. But trank is like a mix of. It's a mix of fentanyl and something else. But like, but that's like, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one that's got people like over, yeah, like, like passed out ground. on their feet, basically. Yeah, they passed like, out on like their feet, like shuffle that. around, yeah. like, uh, yeah. like Trank. you know, it's like it's yeah. that whole, and it's like, um, you know, at the, yeah, it's it's um, it's really there's it's like the most visceral example of like what that what like an inability to properly process and learn something from pain looks like that's like that's that's it that's that's the end of the road it doesn't go it goes a little bit farther but you don't want to go there mission accomplished though right because the because getting back to the other part of the conversation the principalities are like mission accomplished we told you nazarene this is what they were we told you. Right. Yeah. We told xylazine. You xylazine is trank. Oh. Mm. And they mix it fentanyl and xylazine. And we can't. And it's an animal tranquilizer. Yeah. Which is even like, more. Um, this, And this is why I was saying, like, uh, so forgive me, father, but it goes right to the point that it's like, look, they're taking animal trank. They're yep. animals. Yep. This is an animal tranquilizer, and yeah. they're going to take it. This is for cattle. It's for cattle, actually. I wonder, it's a cattle and, and livestock tranquilizer. And that's sure, what people are taking on the street. I'm sure they're that. Cat, they're showing their cattle. I'm sure that you guys are like, oh, you, you would know right away. But I'd be interested to see what <coughs> uh, drug abuse rates are in primarily Muslim countries, like how that's typically handled. Like, I'd be interested if that would be like a big selling point. It's like we'll get rid of your opioid problem. Like we can do that with like you know, um, you know, with the uh, it's like creating a um a problem and having a solution for it. You know, it's like um, no, we we can do that for you, um, but you just you know you got to bow down and worship. No, I really don't know, but I know that it's like a, it's a different thing because like caught, you know, a cot. Yeah, I was about to say caught. Yeah, I mean, it's very yeah, heavily used. It, it's like it's it's different, right? I think it's like. It looks different mm-hmm. there than it does here. I mean, that's mm-hmm. one of the big things, like with the Wahhabists and stuff like that. It's just like they're not like so well known hypocrites of just like you know being these absolute degenerate, you know, mm-hmm. hedonists, but at the same time being like they have the extreme of being Wahhabist Islamists. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like okay, you know, like 
And every Muslim I've ever known could drink you under the table. So, you oh, know what I sure. mean? For sure. So, for yeah, sure. I mean, I think we talked about before that I used to work right next to a primarily Arabic. And I don't want to just be like, just because they're Arabic, they're Muslim, but I'm pretty sure that they were Muslim. Chances uh, are. Uh, uh, like a gas station. And, um, it was like a convenience store and they were always in there gambling and stuff. And I remember, I think we talked about on the podcast. I was like, isn't this not cool? Like, I thought that this was like, yeah, sure. Like the, um, you guys aren't selling liquor, but those like weird, like boner pills, like the weird, like I have no idea what those are. And it's like, and then cigarettes and every type of like, you know, sugar and confectionery treat and, and soda yeah. and everything else. It's like probably I some mean, pig in there too. Probably some pork rinds, maybe oh, in well, there. Yeah, I mean, some know. slim jims, I mean, maybe. You oh, know. Yeah. And then, like, I'm like, okay. <laughs> at this point, this is just lame. Like, if the, if you guys are doing this, you might as well just give me some drugs. Like, because if <laughs> if you guys are doing all of this stuff, like, this is like, how do you do this? And like, it's like. This is like amateur. Like, if, like at this point, I'll just do drugs. Like, because I mean, at, at that point, then like at least I can't even. I'll just drop the pretense that I'm righteous in any way, because like if you can do all this stuff, but you just don't touch these certain substances, you're good. It's like no. At that point, I'll just drop the pretense and just go, you know, smoke pot or get drunk or whatever. You know, like I don't really I'm not going to act like that. This is something noble it's not it's it's if anything it's actually worse so anyway i won't rant about that well if it's just a moral system that you're always going to come down to that Mm -hmm. like you can never you can never the the ground will never hold on a moral system as we see with the decline of america right that it's like well why do we have this it's easy to do chesterton's fence and exactly like you were talking about with the with the sitting down with the tradition and everything it's like if the tradition is just there because it's the right thing to do, and if there's no objective truth to the benefit and the healing that this tradition is is sort of holding and describing, then it's always going to fall away. It's always. But if there's an objective truth and you know that, oh, when I stay on tradition, then my spiritual, physical, mental, emotional health is there. And when I step off the path of tradition, it leaves then you step back on the path. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like it's not even a, you you wouldn't even try to find a loophole because you realize like, well, there isn't a loophole. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. I, I look at it like from a standpoint of like, uh, you know, if you're doing physical training or something like that, it's like, you know, if you're in the gym lifting weights, it's like you got to lift heavy weights a lot. And that's how you're going to get strong. There's no loophole. They can try to sell you some little gadget or something like that, some new thing. No, it's not anybody who knows, knows there's no gadget. It's just like heavy weight, lift it, lift it again. That's it. Do that every day for 10 years. You're strong, period. That's it. That's it. You know, and like this whole thing about trying to find some other way, that's part of it's part of the problem. That's part of the problem, you know. And it's it's also the the. um I mean, there were the the suffering, suffering equaling growth. But I think it's all it doesn't matter what the growth is, like even like the, you know, the caterpillar has to die like the caterpillar is not that's not a happy thing to cocoon itself. It's a dangerous thing. It's all of these things. But it's like over and over and over. We're just shown that like one thing has to die. One thing has to be sacrificed in order for the, for the new thing to come. And and I think that thing, too, is like. This understanding that where it's not just suffering for the sake of suffering, because that mm-hmm. that's we're, we're not talking about some sort of impersonal God and like some abstract metaphysic. It's just like, no, the suffering is there because it reveals the depths of love. That, mm-hmm. that it, suffering is the only way that we can even begin. It doesn't completely, but we can begin to approximate the love that is God. Because the other way is always tinged with with self gratification. Yep. The other way is always tinged with some sort of like reward, some sort of like exchange. Suffering in of itself is the only way you can articulate and express a love that's divine. Because it's complete. Mm. It is love. It's the sense of 
the the care and the desire for the other devoid of the benefit of yourself. That's the love of God. Mm. Like God doesn't love us because he gets something out of it. Like how, how do you, how do you ontologically express that? How do you ontologically express the, the love of God? The, or I should say the love that is God, not the love of God because like his, in his energies, but the love that is God. How can you do it? There's only one that's way. Sacrifice, right? It's sacrifice. It's suffering. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. That's the only way to, to, to experience it and articulate it. That's I mean, it. Yeah. Everything maybe, else maybe is it was... with some possibility and potential for self. I, for, mm. I forget um, what saint it is. I'm going to try and pull it up and I can't, I won't be able to find it. But they're like, if you've just abstained from evil without repenting or sacrificing, all you stop doing is you stop sinning. Mm. And that's it. Like I, I, I'm butchering the quote, but there's basically, it, it's this idea of like, you. Oh, the only thing you've stopped doing is stop sinning, but that's it. Like there, there's no repentance. There's nothing. You've not turned away. Yeah. You've just gotten to the edge of the cliff and stopped. Mm-hmm. Like you right. haven't turned around the cliff of destruction. You haven't turned around and began to walk back the good way. Yeah. You've just, yeah. So anyway, that's, that's what I think a lot of those moralistic systems come down to. I'm sorry. Things are going buck wild in my house right now. Well, so. it's, it's all they, it's all they can come down to because they're not pointed at anything. They're all exclusive, right? They're all negative. This is something that I was I I was thinking like when I'll run across some of these like I think one of the big one who keeps showing up in my because uh, he's becoming very popular is this guy Vo- Vody Bochum or Beecham or something like that. Have you seen oh, this the guy? Pastor. The pastor. Yeah. He keeps showing up, and it's interesting because like he's obviously a very charismatic guy, um, and he seems like a like as it reminded me when you said like evangelicals and Islam. He seems like you could put a little kufi on him and just pop him over to Islam. And it's like there would be no difference, even looks like it the whole nine. But I was thinking, have I ever heard this guy preach about moving towards something? I've only ever heard him preach about what's bad, like what's on the other end of the cliff. I've never heard him preach love. I've never heard him. And it's not like even love for somebody else, but even even somebody to just just love that they would pursue some greater thing right that would that would fulfill them that would illumine them anything it's like all i've ever heard is this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong this is and it's like yeah but why if it's not if it's not it's wrong because it's taking you away from this thing that is good it's taking you away from the good but it's never that it's just this is wrong this is wrong and they're wrong i'm very sorry i just found it it's St. Simeon, the new theologian, so you know it's good. The Master Christ cries out expressly, He who is not with me is against me. And saying this, he shows the one who does not keep his commandments in every way and with every effort and who is constant and who is not constantly acquiring the virtues through the practice of the commandments is, in, is not, in fact, making any progress, but merely seems to be refraining from evil. Mm. So, like, you know, it's just... If you, it's not Dune, you know, it's not like a moral system. It's just, you know, it has to be like approaching the person of Christ. So anyway, I've derailed us for the last time, but things are buck wild. So um, I'm really, I mean, I just I just want to put one little thing on that just to really drive that home. It's like the guy who says, yeah, I don't cheat on my wife. I don't I don't do whatever. And that's enough. It's like. Okay, it's great. Don't cheat your wife, but do you love her? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> sure. like, yeah. Do you love her? Because I, I would even go as far as to say this. I know it's going to blow. This is going to infuriate some people. But if if you can understand what I'm saying in this context, don't misconstrue this. It's better for a man to have failed and struggled but loved his wife than to have never failed but not loved his wife. Does that make, do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? I do. I do. Because love covers a multitude of sins, right? But if you avoid the sin, but have no love, it's like, okay. You know what I mean? Well, your tapioca. There's your tapioca right there. Good job. Um, Something to think about. 
Yeah, I mean, Father uh, Father Cosmos has talked about for um, people who uh, I'm sure he's quoting a father uh, or a saint, but I don't I don't remember who he's quoting. But he says basically like, yeah, you're not predisposed to anger, and you don't get angry. So what? Mm-hmm. Like, if anger is not a problem for you, and you just kind of don't really get you know too terribly angry too many times in your life, so what? Like, it's not a big deal. But if a person who is angry and gets angry all the time, but is constantly struggling against it, that matters so much more. Like, that is so much more. What's that, Father? Republican and the Pharisee, right? Yeah. Republicans like, hey, I've sinned. You know, Jesus said, I came for the sick, not for the those who are well, you know? So we're coming up on two hours. And since we were on a sabbatical because of father's meanderings about Eastern Europe, um, we're going to I'm going to close with one more question. Another another icebreaker, if you will, just, you know, just a little bonus. It's not a hard one, though. What is your guys's favorite um, like chip? Like if you if you are if you're looking at the aisle and there's every chip you can imagine, mm-hmm. what do you go for? Mm-hmm. I got mine. So I'll give you guys a second. And I'm also doing this because I want everyone, all the the hundreds of thousands of followers that we have to go out and support this because I don't want it to ever go away. But Trader Joe's has stuffing flavored potato chips and they are the greatest thing ever made. Like every I feel like year, I've had them and they were very good. Yeah, they it's the best chip out there in the entire world. So um, I, I have two. I have yeah. two. Um. One is these uh, kind of like tortilla chips, but they're they're like a, a very thin, almost like a Dorito, and they're guac, guac chips. They're like these guacamole flavored uh, chips. And the other one I've only encountered here, but maybe you guys have them in the Midwest. It is, I think the company is called Hairs. It's H E R R S, and they are jalapeno potato chips mm-hmm. that. Me and my girls, we can eat like five ba- five large bags yeah, in man. one sitting if you let us. If you let us, like we we don't do that, but they're incredible. So those are my two for sure. Mine are like the jalapeno kettle chips. Like I'm just that's it. That's what. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Jalapeno. They're jalapeno yeah. kettle chips. Yeah, that's exactly what they are. Chip, it's like it's always the go to for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. I think I've eaten so many of those. They've like burned a hole through my stomach. Because every time <laughs> I eat one now, it hurts. I just love jalapeno. I do too. I do no, too. They're so good. <laughs> they're so good. This is Andrew's last thought for the night. And then I'll do our closing thing. Um, Taylor Swift is just queuing on for white women. There, I'll say it. So that's my final thought for the night. We talk about that next week. I don't even understand that. But okay. I don't either, but it's but because it's, Taylor it's, Swift is provocative. It gets the people going. Taylor Swift, <laughs> she gets on her social media, you know, and that's and I'm showing how little I know about this, but I'm not like naming a particular platform, but she'll get on there and she'll be like, hey, guys, this year I'm really into da 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 da. And then that's that thing just sells out. Like, it's like, it's like, okay, well, this year I really, really like these socks from this company. It's fair trade. No animals are, you know, harmed during it. And then their sales just go through the roof. And like, um, you know, if, uh, if she like expresses an opinion, I mean, she like, we've talked about this before, but I mean, if she expresses like a political opinion about something, if she has like a particular thought about something, if she, she has an army. She legitimately has, like, if QAnon and Swifties ever came down, if that was the Civil War, I would bet they would be pretty evenly matched, if not overtaken by the Swifties. And she would, while looking adorable as she spends billions of dollars every year to look adorable, would stand up on her platform raising, like, her spear to charge forward, and everyone would charge forward wearing their Infinity scarves and, like, they're bombs full of pump and spice latte that are like boiling <laughs> hot that like that like rain down on people. I'm just saying. I mean, one side's got the AR-15s, but she's got cannon fodder. 
She's got That's wave true. after wave Waves, after wave, wave of, of bodies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's the Russian army in the situation. She oh, has people no. like lieutenants behind shooting people who turn around and are running back and stuff like that. And the whole time she's like, come on, guys. Those of you who are running without pumpkin spice lattes <laughs> yeah. when the man in front of you dies and drops his pumpkin spice latte, you pick up his pumpkin spice latte and continue to run. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> we're back everyone royal path is back so anyway um if anyone's out there and they're a good visual illustrator a war between the swifties and QAnon would be most appreciated i mean we might even you know make it merch or something like that uh, we'll oh see. goodness um but that's pretty good that's a man in front of you Drops pumpkins, but okay. So thank you. Uh, we're back. Father's on a sabbatical. He was on a spiritual walkabout, um, and uh, it was profitable, from what I understand. Very profitable. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been meaning to say this. This is my actual last thought. Did you know that there's a section in the comic book from Hell by Alan Moore where he breaks mm -hmm. down that all of London is basically built by masons mm -hmm. and on like a pentagram. Like it, it's like oh. all like that. He does this whole chapter where the a guy is basically showing a dude around to all these like masonic sites and basically talking about well, this is why the masons put this here. And it's like one of those people, one of those things where it's like, oh, Alan Moore, you crazy dude. And we're all like, he's telling you exactly what's going on. So, but anyway, well, DC too, right? What's that? Like yep. DC, DC, it's like explicit. Yeah. You know, you go into the Masonic Temple on 16th, which is just like looking at the White House. And then you know that there's a that LaFont built it on a like the Capitol grounds and everything. The cap between the Capitol, the Washington Monument. You know, it's it's built on an owl, right? No, it's an owl. It's a that. giant owl. Oh, dude, just go Washington, D.C. Capitol. It's very easy. Google Maps, Washington, D.C. Capitol. Zoom in a little bit and you'll be like, <gasps> what is this giant owl? Go ahead, all it. of the government here i'll just do it right now it's like it, it it's it's so it's so blatant to it's where the fact that everybody people. doesn't know it and and of course the washington monument is a giant obelisk yeah and uh george washington was a was a, a mason here look I, it won't even be like let's see maps.google.com okay we'll just this is very easy to do uh let me let me pull up one second one second, okay, and I'll do Washington, Cyrus, DC. Here we go. Okay, let me let me uh, lock you guys in here. Here we go. Share screen. Uh, where are we? Washington, Google Maps. Okay, let me close this and let me just zoom in to the Capitol. Very easy. One second. Do do do. It's better. It's better at a distance. Hold on one second. How can I take off the? You can see it right there. Yeah, I was going to say. I... It's right. It's 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 here. But where? How do I? I do. I want to take off like the street names and stuff. How do I do that? Do I do this satellite? Will that be better. Hold on. I think it's Matt's. Uh, there's the. So no, it's here. So there's a pentagram there, but it's this the owl. Is this the owl? Where is the owl? Hold on. I'm having a tough time finding the. Oh, it's here. No, there's some. Oh, geez. I'm having a tough time zooming. No, where is the capital? Ah, here it is. See the owl? Oh yeah, sitting, there it is. There's the owl. Doop doop. Doop, doop. And it's sitting on, zoom out, it's sitting on a giant pyramid. See its feet, the owl's feet right here? So it's sideways. Here's the owl, here's its wings coming out. See the wings? Yeah. And it's sitting on it. A, it's, it's a lot easier. Yeah, right. you got to turn it. It's sitting on a gigantic pyramid, right? Because it's facing east. Mm -hmm. But it's sitting on a gigantic pyramid, and the pyramid comes down to here. Boom. So here's the pyramid, right? Here's the mall. Here's the owl right here, right? And then it comes down. So this is all, that's that's Charles LaFont. So it's a, yeah, completely Masonic designed 
Um, I guess that's my little structure. mini Rorschach test because I immediately saw Spider Man. Spider Man. <laughs> I guess that's my little like mini Rorschach test. So yeah. Anyway, we're back, everyone. Um, we're back. So uh, thank you. Um, yeah, we're back. Uh, I don't forget how I end the show. Um, merch so store. It, what? We have a merch store. We have a merch store, royalpath.store. Uh, we don't see any of that money that goes uh, straight to either the parish or the people um, who make the merch. Um, we also, you can reach out to us at contact at royalpath.network. Um, we have an assistant who helps us uh, with those emails. Um, people looking to reach out, make contact with us. There are still a fair amount of people reaching out to Andrew at RoyalPath.network, which uh, longtime listeners will know that's who you used to contact until I realized I was horrible at correspondence. So now there's someone better in charge of it. Um, then also, uh, thank you, Jack. Jack for the mm-hmm. thumbnails. Yeah, thumbnails. Jack, you're killing it. Again, I'm going to shout out as often as I can. You are doing a great job. Thank you very, very much for your um, for your effort. Um, what else? Uh, every time we mention an artist, it goes on a playlist on Spotify called Royal Path Playlist Pod- or Royal Path Podcast Playlist, something like that on Spotify. Some really good stuff on there. I'll pop it on every once in a while. Um, it's really good. Like there's, I mean, it's the only place you'll hear Kenny Rogers followed by Black Sabbath followed by Death Grips. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool playlist. Um, and speaking of which, I just want to give a shout out to, if anyone hasn't seen it yet, but check out, uh, I think the channel's Harmony. Mm. That Death to the World. Oh, um, Yeah documentary that got put out and oh yeah Cyprian, can we put that in the notes yep. yeah sure. we'll, we'll put the link in the notes please check that yeah, it's incredible it's incredible it's like uh there's some really really cool stuff there um and the, and the guys who have helped with all of our stuff are, are the ones responsible exactly yeah, yeah. it's to wonderful them. to see they are brilliant okay um I can't remember if there's anything else that we do. That's so it. I think that's it. that's it. So thank you very much. And thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.